And now I'm done with my bit. So uh, we're moving into our presentation for the night. It's going to be with Steve Anderson up front. He's going to wave his hand. You're going to see lots of him today. He's going to talk about full spectrum civic engagement. But what he's really going to do is blow your mind. And here's why he's going to blow your mind. Because this is a guy who came and like founded Open Media, who then went on within a year to create the largest mailing list of any nonprofit in Canada. Let me tell you, I was at the Davis Suzuki Foundation at the time. We've been working on that thing for 25 years, and then some jerk show up out of nowhere, <laughs> don't have Canada's panda bear, and made a bigger mailing list. And let me tell you, I wasn't cheerleading for him. I was just a little bit miffed about who is this jerk, where did he come from, how did he do that? So he's gonna talk a little bit about how he actually really engages community and builds these really full functioning campaigns. He's got a new sexy project going on right now, which is called New Mode. And so what he's done is he's taken all the best practices and all the tools that they built out through open media over the years, and he basically said, I could be a massive hog and just like not share this stuff, but why don't I go and actually take these, turn them into more generalized products and open that up to the sector. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the work he's done there as well. Um, but I don't need to pretend I know all the great things about Steve, because he's going to tell you about the great things about Steve. So I'm going to get out of the way. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. It's Steve Anderson. Woo! I usually break it at this point. All right, Steve, it's all you. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks again, Eli and all the volunteers. Um, it's just nice to be able to share the space with you. Um, I'll talk a little bit um, about me. And so, um, as Eli said, I founded Open Media, we're a civic engagement organization that works to keep the internet open, affordable, and surveillance free. How many people have heard of Open Media here? Awesome. That's so nice. Um, so kind of like, the, I like to say like Greenpeace, but for the internet. Um, and as Eli was mentioning, so now I'm trying to share what we learned, share the tools through Numo, which is a purpose-driven social enterprise, um, sharing these kind of civic engagement tools with other nonprofits and other causes. And so really I'm trying to spend my time just sharing what I've learned and trying to help organizations and people um, who are trying to make the world a better place. And that's why I'm here today and just generally what I'm I'm trying to do with my with my time, and you know, I think often speakers on digital engagement like think like they just like magically have all the answers, uh, but really anything that I'm saying today is learned through uh, like some research, but mostly through trial and error. Um, and there's been some error, and I I, I want to start this by noting that mistakes are th they're going to be a thing. If, anyone who's done campaigns work knows that. It's something not to be afraid of. That, that internet to run for prime minister is a, a real actual headline of a press release that Open Media for Real sent in 2011. Um, um, I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute, but I want to just back up for a second and, and give that like a little, a little bit of context. So um, in 2011, we kind of had a we were a really small organization, mostly volunteer driven, and we had this kind of giant campaign that exploded called Stop the Meter, which was all about stopping um, uh, telling companies from putting a pay meter on your internet and making it, the internet more expensive. And I think when we started that campaign, actually, Eli was kind of volunteering and helping us with some stuff at the time. I actually remember you leaving our tiny little office that was all volunteers. And right before you walked out the door, you said, your problems are insurmountable. Close the door and walk out. <laughs> but, um, uh, but anyways, like, <laughs> a, couple, a couple months later, we had, so we had this mailing list that was maybe like 9,000 people on it. That was like our community. Um, tiny little budget, no real office space. Um, and we just kind of hit this at the right moment, at the right time, and kind of we're, we're lucky in some ways, and, and some of our previous learning just kind of came to fruition. And within a few months, we had half a million people who had taken part in this campaign. 
Um, and um, so I think it's one of the largest campaigns in Canadian history now. And so you can imagine um, volunteers, myself, um, others, Lindsay uh, uh, was, at, was there at the time, Riley Yo as well, and, and kind of just like national media coming through, um, our website breaking, 20,000 people a day. Um, doing actions and it was just quite frankly like extremely frightening. I was like, don't mess this up. Um, um, it was basically the thoughts in my head at the time. And if you fast forward to the election that was coming up in May of that, that year, basically we had spent four months just in this kind of grueling campaign trying to build the kind of plane while it was in the air, trying to build the organization at the same time, um, going to CRTC hearings, trying to keep this community engaged. Um, and uh, when, by the time the election came up, we had sort of won this campaign. Um, and, and we were just like so tired of working on this particular issue. And we're like, we wanna do something fun. Um, everyone likes fun things. And so we decided to run the internet for prime minister. Um, we thought it was a great idea. Uh, so we created this character, um, we emailed half a million people about them. Um, we had videos, we had uh, swag that I still have if you want. Um, and I'll, I'll just, uh, there's a reason why I'm showing this, but I'll just um, show you a video just so you can really get a picture of it. What if, what if there was hope, not fear, unity instead of division? What if we had a prime minister with a vision for a connected future? This is not about the West Coast or the East Coast. This is about one connected Canada. The internet has helped connect over 30 million Canadians. It's changed the way we communicate, share information, and collaborate. It is a leader with a positive vision for Canada. This election is about the future. The future of the internet. The future yep, yep, yep. of Canada. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll talk more about this in a sec, but it didn't go that well. Um, and, I'll, and like, some, some people didn't like it. Some people loved it, and like we had like a, a small group, very small group of people liked it. Someone made this. The net. A volunteer made this. It wants to be prime minister of Canada. Can we really trust it? <laughs> it's voted 100% of the time to lower your internet prices and increase choice. This reckless behavior would have a devastating impact on Canada's telecom oligopoly. It wants to reform the CRTC to have a stronger public interest mandate. But is this really in your best interest? It's not even really Canadian. It's been to France and Iran and has questionable relations with China. Can we really trust the net with Canada's digital future? We didn't think so. Paid for by the consortium of powerful vested interests against Canada's digital future. <laughs> okay, I, I have just one more because I find it funny. So, so we... We actually like, there's so many things that we did, um, but we actually like created this character so you could speak through it, through this um, uh, like giant screen. Um, and it's just, I have to show it to you, it's just like a really ridiculous thing. You know, I have to say, it's a little egotistical, but I think that the internet has been the best thing to do. So I can't believe live politics did that first of all. Um, I think that was when they were just getting started. Um, and like when we were leading up to this, Jack Layton agreed to debate Nat. <laughs> what if, yeah, I have that email still. Um, uh, and, and the, so I mean, we thought it was super awesome ourselves, um, but our, our community was just like, we do not like this. Because you have to remember like so many of the people who took part in this campaign, this was like the first political act they had ever done, right? 
Um, and so the so to them it was like we were making a joke of like the first time that they had actually like been activated on something. Um, and so that was the way that they they felt about it. And I I highlight that because um, I kind of do this, yeah. Um, I highlight that because um, it was really important in like everything that we've done since, and we've got some successful campaigns, and I've learned some things. Um, it's just because we learned this lesson that like we're not the audience, um, and we just did some really hard thinking about like, okay, well, like what do we, how do we design our campaigns and our work to really serve the community that we're working with, and to kind of grow the power of the community, um, and so, you know. It, w it was a hard lesson to learn, but it was really important. And I think like these types of like experimentation and monitoring what you're doing and learning is really like more important than anything I'll I'll say today. So um, and also seriously, I do have like a bunch of boat net swag. If anyone wants it. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna go over um, some core components of um, what we're calling full spectrum. Uh, engagement, which is just a form of engagement that I think is really powerful that I've seen work at Open Media and now, now elsewhere. Um, and I'll go through you know, some different principles, um, and then I'll show some case studies. So don't worry if it, if it seems a bit amorphous. Um, I'm going to download a lot of stuff, but then um, I'll actually like show it in action in different campaigns that, that Open Media has, has run. So I'm going to talk about engagement principles. I'm going to talk about um, how full-scale engagement campaigns are networked, how they're multi-channel, and how they're um, relationship-focused. So engagement principles. Um, so the first key principle, um, and this came from <laughs> from that taught us a lot of lessons, but it came came from uh, uh, just other kind of campaign iterations we run at Open Media. But um, so one is um, show malleability. So I mean, people in our society generally like to don't think that they can make change, and apathy and cynicism is is the number one. Um, it's like the first villain you need to you need to fight. Um, and so showing. Um, that society is valued uh, and that people can make change as clearly as possible um, is really important. And just in your communications, in your storytelling, um, it's really important to make that clear um, and to kind of show a roadmap. So think about if you got um, IKEA furniture and you weren't given um, a roadmap or a, you know uh, instructions for how to make that. Think of your campaigns, your communications that way. Explain kind of how the action will lead to an outcome and that society is malleable and just reinforce that with people because they're told the opposite every day in, in other um, in other communications that they can't do anything, the only way that they can um, have an identity and have an expression is by buying things and, and we have to kind of um, beat that back. Um, the, other, the second um, really key principle is give, um, give recognition, so as much as possible and it kind of, they all fit together, show that um, recognize the efforts that people take and how they lead to uh, an, an outcome. Um, so for example, even little things like if your campaign gets media, um, celebrate that with your community and, and note that your community and, and the people you're engaging are the protagonists in that story and that they have had this, this outcome. Um, so recognize all the efforts as much as possible. Like at Open Media sometimes we'll um, we'll name people like this person wrote this letter to the editor and look at it, it's showing up. And so we're just recognizing the efforts. Um, the third thing is be accessible. So the, you know, the key thing is remembering that we're not the audience, like if you're engaging people online. Um, if you're, especially if you're trying to do mass engagement, um, they're probably not working on digital rights or the environment or whatever issue every day like you are. Um, and so just try to be um, as accessible as possible. And, meet people where they're at. So I'll show this um, in some of the case studies, but um, give people um, a really easy actions they can take, really simple, um, but also if people are very highly engaged, then provide them that avenue as well, let them volunteer, communicate with them uh, that way. The fourth one is um, build relationships, not data and mailing lists. Um, um, they're obviously kind of the same thing, but um, what I mean there is, you know, like look at your kind of communications 
with your supporters or your community or your members as building a relationship um, but over over time rather than you're just trying to like build a mailing list or get more data points. Um, and so look at it as like a dialogue or discourse. Um, and then the last one is, is share ownership. So if you have an ability to um, share ownership of a campaign with your supporters or with coalition or network members, the more you do that, the more you'll get into those, those relationships. So at times, um, Open Media has put out a campaign um, and our supporters on Facebook or other social media channels or an email have, have said like, hey, this messaging is insensitive or like, I don't really understand this. Um, and we take that input and we kind of say like, well, it's your campaign and uh, you're making a valid point. Um, we're going to change that. We're going to adapt it because it's about um, sharing ownership. And the same with network partners. How can you invite them into, uh, in, into a project? And I mean, with these things, you can do it in sophisticated ways, but you can also, um, if you have a large community or if you have staff, but um, there's also simple ways to do it. Like when we were starting out open media, um, my testing audience was my mother. Like, I was like, I would call my mom and say, Mom, look at this page and this email. Does this make sense? Um, she'd be like, I don't get this like word. And I'd be like, all right, I have to change it. And so just, you can start anywhere with this. You can start with an audience of one, um, but just try to try to test um, all these things out. So the second main kind of way to do um, full spectrum engagement is to be as networked as you can. So this is with so rather than kind of being kind of top down on operating on your own as an organization or as a person. Um, or um, kind of traditional coalitions where there's committees and that sort of thing. Um, as much as you can, try to run campaigns, engagement campaigns, as a network of organizations and people. Um, and so you want that to be dynamic, so kind of loosely coordinated by a, a dy dynamic network of people and organizations. Um, you want that to be decentralized, so you want there to be a, autonomous engagement and you want, um, you want it to basically be bound within a very simple um, statement of unity. So one example is tomorrow, you'll see this in the news tomorrow, there's going to be a large day of action for the open internet in the US that Open Media and others are taking part, Amazon, Netflix. Um, and what binds them is saying, we believe in the open internet. So it's really easy for a huge number of organizations to get involved in that. And this is going to be probably one of the biggest online campaigns in the history of the world, and that would only be possible if they had, if they made it um, very inclusive and easy to take part. Um, and, then, uh, and then, yeah, so the last one, is, or the third one is inclusive, so let anyone join the project based on a statement of unity, so don't kind of say like, only these types of organizations, only these types of people, um, welcome people and organizations in. And the last one is, um, you want to be amplifying, so members are encouraged to share others' materials. So, um, for example, with the day of action tomorrow, the open media will have a bunch of share images and a bunch of blog content. We'll invite other members of the network to share that. Um, Amazon and Netflix will have stuff, which I'm sure we'll share, because that's amazing and exciting. Um, and so it's about kind of not controlling what everyone's doing, but just amplifying the work that people are doing um, with a common alignment. So I'll skip over this, but if you want to dig in more about like network campaigning, um, there's a group called NetChange. Um, Jason Mogus and Tom Lakis um, work there, and they have a report that's just about this. And they go into more detail about how you can run network campaigns um, and the kind of benefits and the kind of structures that you want to have in place. And I, I highly recommend it if you're trying to do mass engagement work. So the third main element of full spectrum engagement is being multi-channel. Um, so you want to make it so your campaign is impossible to ignore. And so if someone puts up a petition or has a letter writing campaign, and let's say even a lot of people do it, but then uh, it, it dies down after a week or two, then if you're a decision maker, you're going to say like, well, you know, like there's a community here that cares, but like, 
the cost benefit has basically gone away and I can just ignore this and worry about other things. Um, but as I'll show, if you um, have multi-channels going and you kind of do it over time step by step, um, then they're seeing you, if you think about it from their perspective, um, think of them kind of as the audience of these communication channels, they're seeing an email and then they're seeing thousands of people maybe email them. A week later they're getting uh, tweets um, from people, so they're seeing that publicly kind of shaming them or encouraging them to do something good. Um, then maybe they're getting a fax, then maybe they're getting uh, phone calls. Um, so that's another element of kind of this full spectrum uh, engagement. And then the last element is being relationship focused. Um, so this is a pyramid of engagement. Um, many organizations use this. There's other models you can use as well. But the idea is that you're building and deepening relationships with, with people um, in your community and, and you're engaging people that way. And so the idea is kind of like, you know, if I just, if I just met you, um, I'd probably ask you if you wanted to go out for a cup of coffee. I wouldn't say, hey, can you drive into the airport? Um, so you'd be like, what? No, I'm not, I'm not into that. <laughs> um, get yourself to the airport. Um, and so it's a similar idea with the, with the um, pyramid of engagement where you um, start low, make, do a low barrier action. So ask someone like, will you put up your hand and sign this petition and say, I, I support um, X, Y policy. And then over time, try and, try and deepen that relationship. So they're writing letters to the editor, which requires you to actually like, sit down and think um, and, and use your, your voice and put yourself out there all the way up to being a person volunteer or doing phone banking or that kind of thing. So I'm going to do a case study now. Um, so the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, I like funny photos of things. Um, can, does anyone out there want to describe the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement of the TPP? Who wants to try? Anyone? All right, I'll do it. <laughs> um, so the trans Partnership is a multilateral uh, trade agreement, um, including uh, or, organize, or, sorry, countries in the Pacific region, Canada, uh, Japan, Chile, um, and the U.S., others. Um, and basically, it, it's a trade agreement that um, would include things like copyright um, rules, it would censor the internet, um, to put it simply, um, but it would also include things like investor state policies, which would make it so that um, Canada could be sued if we made rules that hurt a corporation's profits. Um, it could undermine our, healthcare, our public health care system because that undermines the profits of certain companies. Um, and so there's a range of other issues, but basically whether you care about the environment, digital rights, um, access to medicine, um, democracy, um, the TPP is seen as an anti-democratic kind of a, a bad deal. Um, and so Open Media um, took on a campaign to kind of educate and engage people on this issue at an international level. And so I'll just talk about it some of how we, how we did that. Um, so this is the pyramid of engagement, um, uh, but showing the kind of engagement pieces that we did with this campaign. Um, so you can see like observing is kind of like emails, website traffic, um, endorsing is people who would sign a petition, um, contributing or kind of sharing on social media, so they're kind of like identifying themselves as part of this, which is important. Um, uh, leading is kind of letters to the editor, crowdsourcing in this case, and then owning is volunteers and donors. And so the idea with this campaign was how do we get a big, deeply engaged um, community of people who will um, stand up against this, this um, problematic um, international trade agreement? Because what we know is when a large group of deeply engaged people speak out on mass over time, um, they can actually stop things, they can change things, they can um, make policies that are in the public interest. And so the first step at the bottom of that pyramid um, is um, 
we have, we have a low barrier, simple petition. Um, which just basically saying, hey, if you think that you have concerns about this like we do, put up your hand and let decision makers know. Um, very easy to do, very simple, um, on purpose. Now, when we did that, we want to um, make sure that voices are getting to decision makers, um, but we also, more importantly, to the principles of engagement, we want to recognize the efforts of people. So, hey, when you sign that thing, when you sign that petition, um, when you send that letter, it goes somewhere, it does something. Um, and so this is us um, delivering uh, the petitions to the chief negotiator of the U.S., so the uh, United States within the TPP. Um, so you can imagine if you're someone, we would email people who signed that petition, Send, send them this photo and, and basically they'd be like, oh, okay, look, when I, when I act together with a bunch of people through open media or through another organization, I can actually like, have an impact, my voice can be heard, um, which, is, which is an important message for people to receive, especially right now. Um, so the other thing we did is, um, I'll show in a minute, this was like a big kind of shared campaign with multiple organizations, um, and we kind of put together all of our energy and we had but it's three million people get involved, one of the larger campaigns in the world, I think. Um, and another way that we deliver voices, um, recognize people's efforts, uh, amplify voices, um, was we projected um, the petition count in Washington, D.C., on buildings around Washington, D.C., um, while Obama uh, was having TPP meetings. Again, deliver the voice, show the people um, can be heard and, and also like deliver that voice to decision makers and say like, hey, we're watching you and there's a lot of us. So back to talking about networks. So there's no way that um, open media could kind of marshal that number of people and build a community that big on its own. Um, and so this is where kind of building networks is involved. And so these are a bunch of, or this is just like a snapshot, but these are a bunch of organizations that we collaborated with um, on the TPP and on this campaign. Um, and so basically, like, they all just signed on saying, we have concerns with the TPP. We didn't ask for anything else on what this specific issue was they cared about. We just said, hey, if you want to work on engaging people around the TPP, then join us. And so some people would talk about democracy and talk about the environment. Um, Daily Coast would be one of those, um, they would come at it that way, um, and they have a really large community of people they can bring. Others, like Fight for the Future, are digital rights organizations, um, and they're based in the U.S., where we have a limited reach, so we can reach people and extend the, the movement that way, and that have become like really important leaders now um, in that way in the U.S. Others, like Imager, is like a website, so they just sent a bunch of people, they had put up free ads. Um, people at Demand Progress are kind of good at lobbying and, and doing policy work. So, the kind of when you bring the, these pieces together, it's much more powerful than if we just let a, a campaign. Um, and um, and it just empowers all of us and builds that broader movement. So the second, one of the second things that we did was. Um, um, asking people to email their MP or to email, um, I think at some point we had people emailing trade ministers or sending comments into, uh, into the TPP process. Um, and so this, it's, it's a little bit deeper engagement, so it's asking people to, to kind of be a bit more um, engaged in our campaign. Um, so we're saying take the next step, send this letter, and so basically this is them kind of, there's a second step and in their information, and there was a letter that would come down um, they could edit that, or they could just send a letter, but it requires just a bit more thought and a bit more dedication than just putting up your hand and saying, I don't like this stuff. Um, so it was getting people to take that next step, and it was also having thousands of people actually send a message that goes to members of department, or goes to trade ministers, or goes to negotiators. Um, so it, it's creating a new channel of communication that way. And so again, kind of trying to recognize people's efforts and deliver voices and actually show them um, their voice matters. Um, we projected their letters and comments uh, inside the meeting room of the uh, TPP negotiating round. So um, when negotiators would come out, they would just see a stream of citizen comments 
Um, and I've got some coach data right there just looking at people. Um, so again, kind of delivering voices right to those people who, who can make choices. And you can imagine if you're a person taking action in this campaign, you're like, whoa, cool. Like they're actually like reading our comments. Um, and the, the TPP made a mistake of letting me do a presentation <laughs> before the negotiators and lobbyists. Um, uh, this is before they shut it down. I hope it wasn't just because of me. Um, but they completely made the process secretive after this round. Um, <laughs> um, and so what, what we did was we asked people to send in comments, and we said that we would deliver it to decision makers at this round. Um, and so while I was speaking, um, we, we had a live stream of, of citizen comments on this iPad, and I just handed it to negotiators, and I said, just sit with this and read it and see what people are saying about the kind of decisions you're making. All right. Um, and we reported back and, and kind of brought people into the process, showed that it's, the system is valuable, showed that we can make change, recognize their efforts. So the next thing we did was we asked people to uh, send a letter to them um, using the, this tool. Um, so you just write your letter and it goes to all those um, publications. So you can. You can see here several publications, and again, like people, like I myself, like have used this tool and it got published in the province. I'm like, cool, awesome. Like, um, so it's it's a really cool thing for people to see. And so after they got published, we email people and say, look, like your voices are getting in, in, in local papers, um, which makes people feel empowered, or it is empowering, and it makes people see that they can make change. One of the last things we did on this campaign was we. We said, okay, like let's actually shape like what, what kind of decisions do we want to see made for our digital future um, or at an international level? Like let's actually be proactive here, and not just say what we don't want, what we do want. And that is a hard thing to engage a mass of people in, unfortunately. It's easier to have people say like bad things stop than it is to be like, let's create a vision together. So this is requiring a, a much deeper level of engagement. But when you have people at getting engaged at this level, they'll stay with you for a long time, they'll donate more, they'll contribute more, they'll provide more value to, to your work and to your cause. So through all of these things, we had, I think, like 300,000 people get involved in the campaign. We turned that crowdsource input and campaign input into a, a crowdsource um, report. And then what we did after that was we went and met with decision makers and said, here's what we want. And again, took a picture, sent it to decision maker, sent it to our supporters to show their voice matters, recognize their efforts. So here is like a, a different kind of shot of that of that pyramid of engagement. So I don't I forget what year it is. They're all kind of blending together now, but uh, September of that year, the engagement period looked like like that. Um, There's 110,000 people at, at the lower level of engagement. Um, 1,400 at top, and then we could track over time and see, okay, we're getting a, a deeper, um, larger campaign engaged by November, 200,000 people um, at that similar level, uh, 2,600. Um, so that's just showing the kind of full spectrum engagement and relationship building that happens over time, and that's powerful, um, and, and decision makers uh, notice that. Um, and, and through doing this kind of campaign, um, you can really kind of shape the debate um, and and show people the, the power that they actually have and, and win things. And so this is a shot of Megan at, at, um, at Open Media, um, and she's just about to go into um, uh, to do a presentation before a parliamentary committee. And um, and afterward, they said, "What was that like?" And she was like, "Well, it was amazing to have all these people behind me and." Um, and you could tell that um, people in that meeting were actually like really shaken up and really like were taking her very seriously what she had to say. It's because there's all these people behind her. There's all this power of this deeply, this deep and wide community. So TDP is dead. Um, Trump wants to take credit for it, but as this Guardian headline shows, it's actually he just took advantage of a movement. Um, but we created a context where the TPP can never go forward. And in this, when I say we, I mean a collective we. Um, 
huge number of organizations, a huge number of people. So I'm going to go into another case study, um, Built C51. Um, how many people have heard of this? So, okay, almost everyone. Um, it's good. Um, uh, surveillance bill um, that Harper put forward that is sadly still kind of in place. Um, uh, there's privacy issues, there's issues with civil liberties, um, a number of issues. So this is just an another kind of example of that pyramid of engagement, uh, very similar to the one with TPP. Um, and you can see again how we did it, very similar. Low barrier petition. Um, email your MP. Letters to the editor. Tweet your representative. Uh, this is uh, Leave Now um, using a um, click to call tool. And again, this is kind of the power of networks. Like at the time, we couldn't bring this to bear, but uh, Leave Now is one of our network partners. So they um, made this tool available um, as part of the campaign. So the results are 300,000 petition signatures, 50 published letters, um, thousands of tweets, um, many donations. Uh, I like to think that we contributed towards Harper's defeat. Um, and this is um, just in, ter in terms of um, recognition and showing impact. Um, after the liberals got elected, um, they, they were happy to, to meet with us. And I think they thought that we would just be kind of polite. And we were, like, we were play with them, but we also shoved that giant petition and they took a picture and tweeted it out. <laughs> so, you know, he, he doesn't, he looks concerned. <laughs> and, you know, there's still a ways to go, but um, we're, we're making serious and really important reforms on C-51. Um, and having talked to the, the minister um, and others in government PMO as well, um, all of them have said it's because they're just concerned with the fact that we have this deeply engaged community um, that will be activated and that will not vote for them next time, things like that, that will speak out on social media. Um, that's the reason that and the network of partners we have doing great policy work, doing great research work. Um, so it's that powerful community of organizations and people that makes this change. So I don't think I'll show these, but basically like my goal is to share this model with other organizations, including the tools, um, uh, and the strategies, um, and, to, and to basically empower other organizations to do this work, because I think that it, it can really make change. I think it can help people, uh, it can help build trust again in our society and our systems. Um, and, and that's really what I want to do now. And I think it can work. This isn't just an open media thing. This is something that can work for other organizations. And it doesn't have to be, I, I know like it can be a bit daunting, but it's kind of, you can start small and work up to, to kind of these more robust campaigns. So in open media in the earlier days, um, we would just do, um, we would do petitions and then we would do email your, your member of parliament. Just, those two things, and that was like, we were still getting people a little bit more engaged, and we were growing our community over time, and we just started adding more over time. So it's not a kind of all or nothing, it's just how do you how do you take some of these principles and the tools that you do have and use them to get a, a bigger community behind your cause, um, and a more deeply engaged community behind your cause. And so this is um, the Canadian Mental Health Association um, that used some of these tools and practices um, around around the election and before the election, and they got all the all the parties to put a commitment to at, moving on the mental health issues um, in their platforms in the BC election. Um, this is the Watershed Watch. They recently won. Um, uh, There's going to be cuts to um, salmon research, um, and they recently stopped that. Um, turns out for happening. Um, Breastfeed University used some of these tools and strategies recently um, to close the, the gender wage gap there. Uh, the SPCA recently won this uh, pet sales ban. 
I don't want to get all political on you, but um, but this is um, from the the Green Party and NDP agreement um, after, or announcement after they said they were going to do a cooperative government agreement. They said to everyone who has emailed, tweeted, called, message, or signed a petition in the last few weeks uh, to tell us what the kind of government they want to see, please know that we've heard you. This deal is happening because of you. And there were tens of thousands of people, a bunch of organizations that were using the, the types of methods and strategies and tools that we're talking about. Ten dollars a day campaign. Um, I don't know. There's a huge list of them. And so this stuff works. And um, I, I think also like the reason why I, I care about this, and <laughs> I'm showing this because I think that these these tools can be fun, um, and we can we can reimagine kind of how our democracy works and rebuild trust um, through these kinds of campaigns, especially if we have more adoption of this sort of thing. And I think we just really need that right now. There's a huge opportunity in this province to make it a better province. Um, but at a national and global scale, I think that there's a, personally, I'm just concerned with the way society is going. And I think that we need to scale up our strategies uh, to meet that crisis. And, and that, that means being as effective as we can possibly be. So that's why every day I'm just trying to um, share this, um, help organizations with different tools. And so um, if you want to talk about that after, I would love to chat with you, because that's basically what I want to do with my life, um, what, it, what, what I am doing with my life. Um, and um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. And I think we should go to Q&A. I have no idea why I have this. I just like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, Eli, can we go to Q&A? Let's do it! Um, awesome. Steve, I'll let you do the pointing and the selecting. Um, and if you could basically just repeat back the question so everyone else can hear it afterwards, um, which means you all need to give it short, pithy question questions, not rambly, statementy questions. That way you can easily repeat them. Thank you. I'll, I'll go with a rambly. <laughs> um, so you cited a lot of examples that are very petition focused. For engagements that are more focused on the people Policy or, or just feedback to inform your direction. What is your advice for getting the more detailed focus engagement as opposed to that high level petition engagement? Right, okay, so tell me if I'm getting this right. So the question is how do we, how do you get more detailed and in depth um, input into a government process or some process rather than just kind of the simple like, petition stop this thing? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's, it, to me, it's the same kind of process I described. So I think you still want to start with something simple um, to get people kind of in the door. To like, like it, it depends on like where your community is starting, too. Like if you have a community of a thousand people and like they've written submissions to government processes before, or they've written letters to the editor, then like, and that's the kind of input you want, then go back to those people and just ask them to do that um, through, um, um, you can create forms that are just open and they can write in what they want, or, or you can have a more detailed letter and say like, send this full detailed policy letter, open media is done that at times. Um, so I think that's one way to do it. If, if you don't have a, a like deeply engaged community already, um, then I think it's find something that will kind of walk them to that process, um, so try to think ahead. Um, and just start with something very simple, like, hey, did, are you concerned with this policy issue? Um, and then they put their hand up by signing up online, and then go back to those people and then try and get them to do the more complicated thing. Because I think the thing is, if you go to someone who's never engaged with your project on Facebook and are like, here, write a 10-page essay on this issue, um, you, you just won't, you won't get many people to do that because it's just a huge thing. It's like asking you, me asking you to drive to the airport. Out of okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Some people will do it, but you're a rare type. 
Uh, next question. Yeah. How would you tackle a very fuzzy issue like climate change? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's easier to solve, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So Howie's from uh, Stan Daughter. <laughs> They're working on this every day. Um, um, also, it's really inspired. I know a bunch of you who are from different organizations, and it's really a bit intimidating and inspiring. So thanks, everyone who's here right now. Um, so how would I do that? I mean, I would. So, I think I would look for where I can, I can um, reach a bigger community of people in, in creative ways, so I would try and map that a bit. So for example, like, thinking of creatively about that, like, hey, like, there's companies like Bullfrog Power and other companies in, who have environmental services. And I would try and reach out to them and say, hey, would you join a large campaign about whatever we think is the best policy thing. I'm not an expert on that. Let's say it's like a really aggressive carbon tax or something. Um, I would say, would you join that campaign? And then I would set up some kind of a, a, a day of action or a week of action that had a clear kind of inflection point and clear delivery, some sort of projection or something exciting. Um, and then I would get those people to send a message to all of their customers on that particular day or week to, to grow a huge movement and then I would push those people to share on social media and I would climb I would climb them up the pyramid of engagement and grow and deepen the community and have other actions. But I think I would do I think you have to start with how do you reach a big community and then how do you engage them? And I think I didn't touch too much on the first question, um, which is a really important one. Um, I touched a lot on the second question which is like how do you engage them? But I would do I would do that so you know um, Tomorrow is this day of action on net neutrality. It's on, on my mind because I'm pretty excited about it. And one reason I think they'll win, because we've seen this before, is you have Amazon, Netflix, Google, others who are going to put up banners telling people to take action. So that's going to be millions of people. And that is just super powerful. And then you're going to have organizations like Open Media, Fight for the Future, Demand Progress, who are going to use this type of model to keep those people engaged, keep them calling, tweeting. Um, engaging with, uh, with Congress until they until they back down. And so when I look at the environment, I think about you know what's their Netflix, like what's their like who has a big audience out there that we can tap into. And so open media, um, an example here, uh, similar is that when we wanted to fight those meter billing prices, we went out to independent ISPs like TechSav and we said, hey, this is going to be bad for you as well. Will you email your 200, 300,000 subscribers about it, and took a, a lot more discussion, but eventually they're like, yeah, okay. And so that's one reason why our campaign was so big and why we won. Um, so that's, does that answer your question? It certainly gives me a sense of your thinking. Okay. Yeah, I think I want to follow up on that because I think at the outset of this, what you faced was this recognition, recognition that your problems were insurmountable. <laughs> and I just want, and I, and, and I, I appreciate that starting position, um, trying to build capacity in political campaigns on the other side of the bridge that have never ever voted in anything other than conservative in the history of confederation. I think we face the same sort of insurmountable position. I'm wondering if you can give us some insight into what we're thinking, how to develop from time from that small space into finding the dominant. What, what moves would you make? Like, what advice would you give to the task that feels Are you trying to conservative into an NDP? <laughs> <laughs> Is that really the question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, on the other side of the bridge, yeah. Um, Down the valley. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you summarize that one. Yeah, well, I think the Where question was, <laughs> how do you um, <laughs> t turn a conservative into an NDP or t turn someone who has uh, um, who is supporting something that you don't believe in, maybe that's Trump or something like that, um, into someone who is aligned with your values and, and supporting change in that direction. Um, if I had that answer, <laughs> um, or if I had a really good answer to that, I, I would be doing it for sure. Or I would 
spend more of my time doing it or not sleep or something. But I think um, I think what I could what I could say to that is um, I think there are um, common values that all people have. I think that's fairness, um, human dignity, um, and I think that there are there are issues that speak to that that can connect with people who might be supporting uh, something that's on their interest, like Trump. Um, and I actually think like the net neutrality example is a good one in that um, it's just basically standing up for free expression online, and that's something that regardless of your political views, you can believe in. There's lots of people who are conservative, um, libertarians, um, who share that value. Um, and so you can connect with people there, and then you can start a relationship with them and kind of move forward over time. And I think one thing about open media is that, like, you know, in a way that's, that's partially, I think, what we've done with, with issues around the internet. There's lots of people who are um, far right wing, um, uh, share different values across the political spectrum. We worked with the National Firearms Association on privacy issues. Um, but we just found common values and then moved forward from there. And I think that's important for, for like, changing politics and in a progressive direction if that's if that's what you're after. But I also think it's important um, for us to not be so um, polarized and for us to rebuild our trust in, in each other, which I think is crucial. Because um, I think that it's really dangerous when we have en masse people don't trust each other and don't believe that they can work together to solve our problems. I think that is just like a problem that we need to work on through our campaigns in general. Yeah, um, I like your uh, ladder of escalation, especially starting with the low barrier of entry. But I've got a question on a bit of a different problem. What if you're dealing with a community who's really stigmatized and so stigmatized that they won't go public when you're talking about adults with ADHD? So people who work with ADHD, like myself and others, hear the stories, hear the horror stories. They don't tell the media, and they don't tell politicians, so politicians and media can ignore us. And it's just a few people, and most medical people won't do anything to change it. How do you even begin from that point of view? You don't have people wanting to public, you don't have a lot of funds. How do you actually approach something like that in a different sort of way? Is there any other, any other Yeah, so the, the question, if I can summarize it, is um, how do you um, build an engaged community and make change um, with a group of people that might not be comfortable being public with the issue or the concerns that they have? Is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the example is people with ADHD or people who want to make change there. Um, and so I think the first question is find where the, where the people are that um, are out there. So are there other groups? that are already working on this that could um, connect you in? Is there um, research departments that are working on this? Um, like, find whatever community that already exists. Like, open media at the really early days, like, we were, like, going to faculty associations and being like, can you email your, like, list of students who are doing communication stuff? Because that's where we could find people um, that we could reach. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is, um, you could use tools through Umode or, or elsewhere that are, you could configure them so that they're less kind of public facing. It definitely makes it more challenging um, overall, like on an issue like that. Um, but, but you could make it so that um, when you're sending messages to members of parliament um, or other decision makers, um, it's not publicly identifying you, it's just saying, I'm a local constituent at this postal code. Um, who's concerned about this. So there's ways that you can kind of craft the engagement so that it fits to that um, particular constituency. Any other questions? Yeah? Um, I feel like you talked a lot in your experiment of engagement about online engagement. I'm wondering if you have insights on how to incorporate like 
moving from sort of online to offline action at various points in the pyramid? Mm -hmm. The work that open media has done? Yeah, um, open media is definitely, myself personally, are, are definitely have more expertise in the online, and we just really like tried to master that one as <laughs> we could. Um, other organizations like Organizing for Change, Dogwood, Stand, others um, are, are stronger in, in offline engagement, but I think there are some general principles. So um, the more you climb people up the pyramid of engagement, the more likely you can move them over to offline. Um, and so that's something that a lot of the groups I just mentioned in general, they're trying to, they're usually trying to um, climb people up the pyramid and then when they get a certain point, be like, hey, now join a form then, or hey, now come and do canvassing with us locally. So I think it's as far up as you can go, but you know, if you're in like a campaign moment, you're probably just gonna email everyone and be like, come to this canvassing thing. Um, but if you can, find people up and have people who are a bigger community up top, um, it's much easier to convert them to do the offline stuff, which I think is like, it can be the most powerful form of engagement, like super important. Any other questions? Yeah? Do you have any advice for picking up your email list when you don't have any subscribers? Can you say that again? Um, when you first started out, Yeah, um, so the question was, um, thank you, Kate, for having me do that. Um, the question was, um, before you have a community or a mailing list, um, like, how did open media and, and what advice can I give about um, kind of growing your email list to start? Um, um, and there, there's, a, there's a bunch of different, different ways. I mean, if you have a budget, um, you can go to an organization called Care2 that basically will run a petition on your issue and invite people to opt in to join your community and then you can then engage them from there. Um, so that's one idea. Um, another idea is um, have a really low barrier action and use um, Facebook ads, if you have, again, if you have a budget. Um, if you don't have a budget, um, or if you do but want to be more creative, I would just think like first principles of like, where is an accessible community of people who might care about this? Um, and so, like I was saying, you know, if you're an environmentalist, maybe that's full plug power. Um, uh, um, so at, at Open Media, we were, we, like I said, we were kind of going to like academics and being like, hey, we know you care about this. Email your students. And so like wherever people are, um, and it's, it's hard to generalize, um, but I would just go through a process of thinking about that and asking, like, like Open Media really joined as kind of a network of organizations, and we just had calls where we like, how do we reach people? Like, we just ask ourselves questions, and some people were like, I'm an academic, I know these people, I have this mailing list. Other people were like, oh, I actually, like, have, like, this big, like, mailing list I started randomly, and there's 500 people on that, and you know them. And then uh, we had the Council of Canadians, who was the early supporter of Open Media, and they were really generous with helping us with their reach in social media, or, or just, sorry, it actually wasn't even social media at the time, but, um, but just helping us with their reach they could do through their mailing list and, and otherwise mailers, actually, as well. Um, old school, dating myself. Um, so I think you just have to ask the question with the people that support the cause already and, and have the conversation and, and think about where, where you can reach people. Any other questions? I was gonna say for the policy wonk question that was asked before, maybe you could mention about the Save Our Security tool and the concept of introducing talking points into people's outreach when they're reaching out to representatives, because that was a thing that's a good like in-between thing that might not fall on the pyramid so much. The crowdsourcing tool? The, the uh, Save Our Security, uh, yeah. Well, the crowdsourcing, but also the for the consultation. Okay. Um, so NASDAQ works for Open Media and um, <laughs> has been very involved in some of our, our recent campaigns. And so um, NASDAQ was asking if I could speak to some of the ways that Open Media has tried to engage people in a, in a deeper way on more detailed policy elements and just speaking a little bit more to some of the, the, the newer stuff that, um, that Open Media um, has, has done. And um, I think that's a good question, good point. Um, 
So one thing that Open Media did to kind of engage people in deeper policy elements is we had a, a tool where you could, you had t policy talking points um, listed beside the tool and they were detailed and sophisticated. Um, we, made, we made them as accessible as we could, but they were like real policy talking points, um, you know, talking about, uh, pointing to legal language. Um, and this was part of the C51 uh, government consultation. So we wanted to empower our community to send specific policy points into this government consultation. That was kind of the goal. Um, and so the, we made it so those talking points, you could just click on them and it would enter the policy point into this tool. And so you could just choose and then you could edit from there. So it made it, it kind of just made it feel and just legitimately be easier to kind of put in sophisticated talking points into a tool, um, into a government consultation process. So it wasn't requiring you to just either like look at a big letter and agree with it or edit or write in policy points. It was kind of giving you point by point in accessible but policy language, um, the ability to do that. Um, the other thing that Open Media um, recently did to kind of engage people deeper in, in policy points is um, we didn't we didn't trust that the government was going to actually listen to people um, in their C51 consultation, even though they said that Goodale was like, we're definitely going to listen to you. We're like, oh yeah. Um, and so, so initially what, what we, we did was um, we had a campaign to push them to make the results of the consultation public because governments and the NEB and environment, environmental sectors um, is kind of known for this. They'll kind of be like, hey, we'll listen to your input. It goes to a black box, and they're like, everyone said everything's fine. <laughs> Done here. Um, and so we, we, we've seen that movie before. So, so we ran a campaign demanding that they make the consultation input public. And then eventually they buckled on that, so that was a win. And they made the results available to us. And so we had an agenda there. And our agenda was we took those, tool, those comments, we put them in this crowdsourcing tool, um, and we invited our supporters to rate each comment. So we had people rate thousands and thousands, 50,000 comments. Um, people across the country say like, and we just asked them a few questions, like does this comment say repeal C51? Does it say add new oversight measures, um, et cetera? Um, and so we actually had them crowdsource. So people who are at that level where they actually want to read a citizen submission on a policy thing and rate it for us. Um, we gave them that avenue to engage at that level. Um, and then afterwards what we found was most people want to repeal C51. So we announced that. We said, okay, all you have to do is do the right thing, good deal. Um, so it just frames the debates and, and, and shapes the, the debate and, and just lets people get engaged at a deeper policy level because there are people like in open media's community who are definitely right there. Like they want to submit detailed policy positions. And if we just ask them to sign a petition, that's almost insulting to the level of engagement they have. And so we want to meet them where they're at in that way too. Um, and so, yeah, thanks for playing that. Did I, I think I captured it? Yeah, and you could also point to the success of that one, the crowdsourcing. Like, we ran out of comments within a few hours of the emails going out. Yeah, what NASDAQ said is we, yeah, we actually, we are like, we'll just throw like a batch of, I don't know what, 10,000 or something, and like, it'll be enough that we can like, make a statement about it. People probably won't like, or I think we were like, we don't know how many people are gonna like, like this. It's a big ask to do, like to read something and rate it, stand behind it. Um, and what we found was like, yeah, within a couple hours that we ran into those comments, we're like, ah, and then we had to like keep throwing them in, and basically they rated all, every single comment. Um, so there was a, it was surprising to me um, that um, people had that thirst. So there is like this hunger for people to have real authentic deep engagement. Um, and so you just have to provide that avenue to them. I don't think like every person, um, someone who's just hearing about C51 might not jump through that hoop yet, but there's definitely a, a community and a, and a hunger for that. And I think that is not just the media, I think that's any issue that, that affects people's daily lives. Like people, if you give them an avenue to have their voice heard that feels real, that is real, um, people will, will take that. There's this kind of myth that um, that people, millennials and the people in general are disengaged. Um, but actually, if you look at the research, they're more engaged locally, they're more engaged in these types of campaigns, 
And it's because they're not engaged in traditional politics as much, it's because they don't think that their voice is going to be heard in a real way. Um, so, but when you give them an avenue that's real and, and show that roadmap, they'll take it. I think that's the lesson to take from what, what Mass has referred to. Any more questions or comments? Just a comment. Corbyn got 74% of millennials to turn up because he gave them a reason to turn up and no one else did before that. And that level of engagement was, was just insane. Is that what Bernie you're talking about? Sorry? Who are you talking about? Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn. He got such a huge break, but he targeted specific policies versus come in and just endorse what we're doing and just, you know, knock on doors and, and follow what we decided. So you give them a strong <coughs> Yeah, so the comment is just <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn um, got 74% of millennials to, to come in and support him um, because he actually invited them to participate in an authentic and real way and spoke to the actual issues they cared about. So that's just another example of there's this latent desire to participate in our, in our democracy. So I think we'll cut it off there. Sure. Yep. Uh, but of course, the conversation will go on because as I said, booze afterwards. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Perfect. So, uh, thank you so much for uh, being attentive and polite and upstanding. You guys are all real solid human beings. I'm a big fan. So, here's the dealio. We have show-off time coming up next. Um, so, again, I'm going to give you exactly 60 seconds, unless you're faster, for you to come here and talk about a thing you want, a thing you need, a thing you've got to offer. So uh, I'm going to model this for you, and then I want you basically to all come and like line up here, and we'll all start um, giving you a chance to show off. I can run the laptop, so if you've got like visuals or a website you want to load up in the background, we'll make that thing happen. Chad, of course, is going to be number two. He's surely got something fascinating to talk about. Always, always. <laughs> so let me model this. Here, what you're going to do is you're going to come, you're going to say your name and your organization, and then you're gonna go and like give your spiel. So, let me start that thing off. Hi there, my name is Eli Vandergeese, I'm with NetSquared Vancouver. And what I have to offer you today is a free day pass to the Hive. So if you are intrigued by this space and would like to try it out for a day, these magical cards give you free pass. Come talk to me, or the cards are gonna be right up here. Um, you'd be a fool not to take one if you're curious. So that's me, and that's my 45 seconds. Who would like to go next? Anyone else got something fasting? Maybe there's something cool happening with uh, Open Data BC. A cool thing, an upcoming event. Nothing. Come on up, come on up. So do you do the intro and do the spiel. Okay. Hi, my name is Maria. I also work for Open Media, and I'm actually looking for help. Uh, if you've experienced tracking uh, conversions or new joins from your campaigns on social media, uh, I'd love to hear from you. My email is just maria at openmedia.org. Thank you. Lightning fast, love that. So who's next? Who wants to come on up? I'm ready, I'm ready. Bring it on. All right. So uh, my name is Chad, and outside of bringing you popsicles, and there's four left, and they're melting right now. We want to eat them. There is no freezer. It is up to you to save the ice cream. Um, my day job is I work for a Canadian charity called the Neil Squire Society, and we were funded by Google to make this device. And what it is for people that have a very high level physical disability, can't use their hands, it's basically a mouse that you use with your mouth. So you can mount it to your wheelchair, and very limited movement, you can kind of move mouse cursor and sit and pop the tap. We've released it open source, so it's not like another $2,000 medical device. We build for about 200 bucks worth of parts. Um, we built about 100, but I got one of our 200 people on the waiting list. So if you're looking for like a team building day that's like fun, um, I'll bring the soldering irons, I'll teach you how to solder. And uh, I've had grade nine students build 20 minutes in a day. I believe you can do it too. So I need some volunteers helping build these devices. If you're interested, love to chat with you over that beer. Cheers. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have any kind of like an upcoming gala, looking for a volunteer, have something to show off about? Come on out. 
Hi, um, it's my first time here. Woo, uh, welcome! My name is Uli. I'm not a nonprofit. I'm not um, an activist. I'm just a regular person who spoke up about Airbnb in Vancouver. I have a Facebook page called uh, Homes Not Hotels. And uh, the city is responsive, citizens are responsive, but I'm just one person. I'm just a regular person running a Twitter and Facebook. And uh, don't know what to do next. Don't even know what my question is, but uh, I'm open to discussion on that, open to help, and uh, activating a bit more efficiently. Thanks. Cool, thank you. Anyone else have a tip? Perfect. Hi, my name is Chris Chapman. I am uh, the co-campaign manager for the Surrey Cloverdale MEP. Um, one of our members is involved with opening up what I believe the first co-op cemetery in DC. We have been given permission to have a zombie run there on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I think this sells itself, but um, <laughs> I use pen and paper and I need to build capacity. If anyone can help me, I would sure appreciate your help and advice and all of that. Um, in return, I'll give you all my love. <laughs> awesome. Is there a place where we can find out more about this? <laughs> Not yet. That would be the first thing. That right. Be first step. <laughs> awesome. 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 Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Anything else? Anyone else have what, anything you want to show off? You've got this is your last opportunity. We're not back until September. That's right. Come on up. Don't be shy. I don't, I don't want to miss a chance. Oh, come on the side of the speaker so you don't get feedback. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, there we go. Um, hi, Denise Williams. I'm the executive director of the First Nations Technology Council. And uh, oh, I'm, thank you. Yeah. I'm your fan too. Um, so we're launching a provincial strategy to increase the number of Indigenous people participating in BC's tech sector. Uh, we're going to be launching in November. The idea is that Indigenous people from across BC will be participating in a 12-week uh, certificate program from the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology. Uh, from there, they'll be moving on into internships um, with any technology company, uh, entrepreneur from around BC that's willing to uh, host an indigenous up and coming talent uh, resource. And from there, they'll move on to advanced streams in web development, GIS, uh, communications, social media, office professional type work. And what I'm looking for is um, people who would be willing to mentor um, indigenous tech talent and not-for-profits and other companies uh, that would have them in as uh, co-ops or interns. Uh, even just really brilliant people that are in this room that would be willing to talk to me about it and uh, let me give you my pitch and see what you think. So I'll be up here having the free drinks. Yay! <laughs> we have room for one more. Who's gonna, come on, come on up, come on up. This is your chance. Awesome, remember to introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Yvette, first time here, and I'm from, from the Surrey Hospice Society. We've been around for 30 years, and um, we are a very low-tech organization, but we need lots of support, especially around outreach. Um, many people don't like to talk about grief or death or very serious matters, and um, so in order for us to fundraise or do any kind of um, community connections, we really need to have people understand what we do and have a very good message about it as well. So what we need and what I'm looking for is perhaps somebody that's a good storyteller, a digital storyteller that can, um, if you look at our website, it's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it, it's better than it was before. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we really need to add some storytelling to what we do so that people don't get scared when I say I work at hospice. They're just like, oh my god, I don't want to talk to you. So um, if anybody knows about um, a company that can help us, um, we don't have a lot of money, but um, we have a lot of creativity and um, in need of support. So volunteer or very low fee, whatever would help. All right? Awesome. So we are now coming up to the end of today, but there's one last thing. 
So I'm going to want to keep four people behind. Two of those people are going to move chairs. So it's like, we're not talking about the world's heaviest, ugliest work, but you need to feel comfortable with like doing a little bit of lugging as we put these chairs away and sort of reassemble this space. Two other people need to be on dish duty. We have got fresh dishes like that need to come out of the dishwasher, and then basically need to take all the dishes that have come from you guys and we do a quick reload. And that just makes us look like the world's best tenants, so the hive will continue to donate their space. So if I can have four people maybe put up their hands, I see one, oh, two, three, oh, and there's four. Great. Those four, my thank you so much, you're amazing. So while well, those four people are sweating here in the hive minds, Stephanie, who is going to stand up, is going to take you for booze. So we're going to go down to Darby's. It's about a block and a half down that way, down east. Um, but she's going to escort you so you don't get lost. First drink is going to be on us. After that, you got to take care of yourself. But uh, we're going to at least ease you into this. And it's a school night, so we don't need to go crazy. Um, so Stephanie's going to leave in about five minutes. So if you just want to basically loiter up top, she will gather you there. She's going to yell it out loud as she heads out. Um, and it's all going to be amazing. The hard four are going to hang out with me and Chad for a while. We're going to do a power clean. And then we're going to come and join you. Uh, so uh, don't be out of control by the time we get there. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming out. Thanks so much to our host, The Hive. And uh, thanks so much for Steve for blowing our minds today. Super helpful. We'll see you all in September. Later, y'all.